Welcome to Garvan. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest is Nicole Senqui. I've met many runners at the Nike Running Club, but Nicole was not one of them. She was well known at the club because she had captured the heart of Jonathan Cain. She was also a very fierce triple threat in running, swimming, and biking. Please welcome to the show, Nicole. Thank you, Will. Nicole, let's get started by sharing with us, with our audience, a little bit about yourself. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and I came to the States when I was eight years old. Came to Trenton, New Jersey, very much not like where I was from. Very different. <laughs> very different, very different. And went to school here, middle school, high school, and went to Amherst College, and then after that, went to Columbia University for my master's. Wow, those are prestigious schools. When you were a youngster, were you athletically involved? My mom's side of the family played badminton for Jamaica, and so I always saw my family in athletics, but I was too young at that time to be participating in any of that. and. The nature of my athletics was we would play a lot. We just, I have, I'm from a big family of, I'm one of six girls, and my mom is one of 13, and so I had so many cousins, and we played and played, and it was always, you know, you run, you throw the ball, and like you just have an instant team. So that was the extent of my being athletic. You moved here at nine years old. At eight, yes. At eight, yeah. and what was the big difference when you got here? I had an instant family in Jamaica, and there was never any time where I thought, oh, who can I play with? Like, there was always companionship. And then when we moved here, it just felt really lonely. It was, um, it was really tough. It was tough, but did you yeah. get involved with new friends and athletically? No. no. <laughs> I think um, I spent the first few years just, I always say, you know, we were the weird immigrant family. Um, and people said, oh, you know, say this word again or say that word because we had an accent. And I just felt like we were a novelty. And I thought, I don't want to be a novelty. And so in the beginning, I, I mean, I just stayed with family. And, you know, I met friends here and there. But um, for the most part, I was just trying to figure out what it was to be American. Mm -hmm. Which high school did you go to again? I went to the Petty School in Heightstown, New Jersey. Okay. Um, and I was a boarder there. And, you know, that was another culture shock to me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And did you get involved with athletics there? There, um, actually, that was the first time that I was really involved. And the funny thing about how I even started in um, running was my sister had gone to the local public school and she was a field hockey player and so naturally I thought I would play field hockey and on my way to practice to um, to tryouts for field hockey because I was going to play field hockey um, my science teacher saw me and he said hey Sinqui you coming out for cross country and I said sure I am coach Lawson and that was the end of that <laughs> Cool. Yeah, in college I ran cross country for two years and I never did track. I, um, I mountain biked a lot. What was your studies? I studied black studies and um, I also studied math. But I think you're a mathematics teacher. Yes, I am. I teach at Dalton and I teach in the high school there. How did you become a teacher? Well, I do like working with kids and I have experience um, in this area and I remember taking the first job that was offered to me in Virginia and I can't say that was a good fit and so then I moved to Brooklyn to the Packer Collegiate School and I met really wonderful people and I had some fantastic students but I don't think I was ready to be in New York or to continue teaching at that time and I quit my job and I gave up my apartment and I was going to just travel the world or be somewhere else. How old were you at that time? I was 22. 22. 22. And my parents thought, you have a good job. Why are you leaving? And I just, I wasn't ready to be here. And I ended up going out to California. I had this idea that California was going to be it. And I actually really enjoyed California, but my family was so far away and that was hard for me. And I remember my sister in the Bahamas saying, that, you know, I could look there for a job, and it was a job in um, the pharmaceuticals. And it turns out that the job was in Puerto Rico and not in the Bahamas, and that wasn't really going to work out. And she said, well, you know, you can stay here in the Bahamas while you figure things out. 
And I remember one day, and at that point I was about, I was 24. And at one, um, at one point I'm in her house and I'm crying and her husband comes over and he says, you know, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. and, he, and I said, I just feel like the biggest loser. You know, I went to a good school and here I am, I don't have a job. And he said, about my sister Corrine, he said, has Corrine made you feel unwelcome here? And I said, no. And he said, have I made you feel unwelcome? I said, no. He said, so what's the problem? And I thought, wait a minute. I'm living in Nassau, Bahamas. The ocean is across the street. I'm with family who I love and who love me. I have my little niece and nephews who are so sweet. What was the problem? Mm -hmm. And I had such a great time down there. Like I felt like my whole image, whereas in the States, I was trying to see who I was, you know, and I felt like I was defined by, you know, where I went to school and what job I did. And down there, like my title was Auntie Nikki and I loved it. And um, at one point while I was really enjoying myself, I had a kayak and it was wonderful. Um, at one point, uh, my sister said, you know, you really need to start looking for a job. And I thought, wow, I have to go back to America. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a job that opened up at the Dalton School and I got an interview and I taught this class that was amazing. I wasn't amazing, the class was amazing. They were so invested and just eager to learn and, and I still think of that class. Um, and those kids, they were so wonderful and energized and just they were learning for learning's sake and it was such a beautiful thing. And it was kind of unner unnerving for me to think, I really want this job. Like, I want to teach those kids. And Dalton has been so amazing to me and for me. Mm -hmm. And my colleagues are so bright and they're so kind and invested. And, you know, students that I've taught from my early days there to now, I just think, I like you. I would love to just hang out with you and talk with you. Mm. And many of the kids, I, you know, I still see these days and um, I run with them and um, really? yeah, like I see them outside of school and I, you know, like I just feel lucky. So you're more than a mathematics teacher, you're a role yeah. model for them in terms uh, of maybe. the physical <laughs> activity because yeah. you know, kids today are always uh, on their yeah, toys. That's true. You know, especially this year where I've had some students say to me how they've looked at my athletic achievements and that has inspired them. That just really means a lot to me. I can Google you. Oh <laughs> my goodness. Uh, some amazing thing. Geez, what kind of mathematics do you teach? Classes I've taught are Algebra 2. Um, the honors class, they, we do more like pre-calculus stuff in there. And we have some smart kids in that class. Um, geometry. I was a mathematics major in high school oh, and college, yeah. and I love mathematics. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting, uh, you run with the city coach, mm -hmm. and one of my early guests, or prior guests, was uh, Francis LaRosse, and he's... I went back to college again, and I'm completing a degree in uh, math education at NYU at the moment. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I have a degree in mathematics, so I love that. Yes, oh, we have talked. We have talked math. <laughs> we have talked math on runs. Oh, um, cool. <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. Recently in the news, they're talking about whether algebra is necessary for our students to oh, learn. I saw that article. I saw What's that article in that? the Times. And I, you know, I think, how are you going to argue for dumbing down any curriculum? Um, I just, I, I didn't see how you can be an educator and support that. Really? Yeah. So you believe in mathematics for everybody? I do. I just think there's some stuff that's hard, and you work through it to the best of your ability. And for a lot of people, math is hard. Of course. I but mean, I, I think in college, and there were some math classes where I thought, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you think the mathematics is important. Most girls don't take it to math, but you did. So why, was there some reason why you liked math with your mom or your siblings uh, and influence? You know what, my 
experience in math through high school, like middle school, high school. Like I just always had very supportive teachers and also just the people I hung out with. They did math and we just went to class together and it, and you know, you didn't think of it as girls doing this or boys doing this. You just did it and and you know I think of my grandmother who didn't have um, any formal education she was from China and girls didn't go to school and um, you know from she they were poor and they sent the boys to school she didn't have that opportunity but she was so good at math and I just and I think that was part of it is like here's this woman who I absolutely adored she I mean is still She's, she's dead now, but she is, I still think of her and think of her so fondly. And she was just so good with numbers. And, you know, and I think of my husband, Jonathan Cain, who I call him my rain man. You know, he's so good with numbers. And, and we celebrate that. Yeah. Rain man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that's a defective term. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Well, so cool. I, 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 like I said, I love math, and it's always a struggle when you read the paper to get more women or more girls to mm -hmm. like math, because up to a point they, they sort of stop and they right. sort of look. It's, oh, wait a minute, this is a boy right. thing. But and you hung out yeah. the right crowd yeah. that supported you. And also, like I think of um, at Dalton where. We have a lot of girls in the math and sciences, and they're strong, and they feel like they very much belong, and they do. It's cool. We just need more schools like Dalton. Yeah, you know, you know what? I, um, I really am so impressed with a lot of what we do at Dalton. I really oh, excellent. am. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's uh, move on ahead because, as I mentioned, you're a triple threat in any sport you enter in practice. <laughs> How did you develop to go to the next level in your skill set? You know what? I It's funny because I remember in college, I went into the pool and I thought, you know what? I'm a pretty fit athlete. Why can't I swim a length of the pool? I just couldn't understand it. And I realized that's because I wasn't breathing. I didn't know how to breathe. I think I'd had maybe two swim lessons when I was younger and then we moved and like I just had tried to figure it out on my own and I remember the lifeguard here and there giving me some pointers but you know no official swim lessons and then I finally figured out how to breathe but even now I mean the swimming's the weakest of my three sports and eventually so I you know I was a runner that's who I was even though there were women running a lot faster than I was. And I remember, you know, cross country sometimes I was thinking, ladies, we don't have to go that fast. We're div three. We're smart, we're smart. Really? <laughs> but they, they ran fast, they ran fast. And, um, and the school had put on a triathlon. I, I said, all right, you know, I'll try. And I ended up winning and and it was mostly because of the bike, because I was, um, I'd done a lot of mountain biking while I should have been studying. Um, and the bike was, I was strong on the bike and, you know, and my run was good enough. And you would think after that success that I would have continued with triathlons. Oh, and I'd done it on a borrowed bike. And I thought, I'm a mountain biker. I'm a runner and a mountain biker. And to be a triathlete, you have to have one of those fancy road bikes. And I wasn't interested in that. And years later, when I met Jonathan Cain, um, he said to me, you ever consider doing triathlons? And I said, you know, I did it a couple times when I was in college. And then I said, you know what? I'm injured from running. I need to do something else. And he said, so triathlons, would you be interested in that? And we started training. And in the first year, I had a torn hamstring and a torn labrum. And, I entered this one race because I was going to get surgery like a month later and the doctor said, you know what, if things fall apart out there, you're going to have surgery anyway, just do it. And I'd, wow. I wasn't doing any running and I came in second. And I thought, oh, maybe I can be good at this. And every eventually everything healed, but it took a long time. I was injured just for a long time. And Jonathan said, you know what, if you focus on tries, I really think, he said, you know what, I'm not one of these coaches who will tell you that um, you can achieve this if you can't. And he's really, he's my biggest supporter, but he's also very honest. He'll tell me when I can do well in something and when, you know, my sights are a little too high. 
Um, I laugh because I said to him one day, I said, you know, if I had thought about it and trained for it, I think I could be an Olympic cyclist. And he says, what color is the sky in your world? And I said, no, no, no. Like, I'm a really good cyclist. He goes, no, you really couldn't be. And so I tell you that story because he's just honest. And after watching the cycling on at the Olympics, yes, yes. I thought, what the heck was I thinking? No, those women ride really fast. But um, you started training and and seeing results. And so 2009, I had done half a season, and then 2010 was my first full year of racing triathlons. And I got all American and placed in my age group um, at nationals. And I think my my crowning achievement of that year was I'd done a bunch of sprints um, and I'd won all of the sprints. I mean, when, when I say it, I won all of them, it all depends on who shows up and what race it was. And the races that I, I you know, signed up for, I won. Mm-hmm. And then Jonathan said, you know what I think would be your distance? The half iron. But I'm a sprint. And I came home and I said, Jonathan, I found a race, you know, it's this amount of miles swimming, this amount of miles biking, and then a half marathon at the end. I said, I think that could be my distance. He said, that's the iron, right? That's a half <laughs> iron. And I said, oh, he goes, you're a math teacher, right? <laughs> and it just didn't even occur to me that those numbers matched up oh. in my debut. I came out of the swim, and there was this long run from transition, and it was raining that day, so, like, I put on this jacket, and then I took it off I think like I was like Naomi Campbell doing a whole diva change in there my transition time was pretty long so I go out and I ride and um, at one point there's just nobody around me and I'm thinking lost yeah am am I lost or am I in the lead where is everybody and then I saw the leader Susie Serpico who eventually went pro and she's just a phenomenal athlete and just a really nice person. And then I saw the turnaround and I thought, no, she's in the lead. And I ended up taking third in that race. I thought, wow, this was great. And Coach Kane was the one that really discovered your talent in terms of encouraging you. My name's Jonathan Kane and I coach runners. I think about it now, if it weren't for him, I would not be in the sport of triathlon. Now, when did you guys get romantically involved? How did that happen? (laughs) So it actually happened, started when I was injured and I was walking through the park and I ended up seeing some friends and we were stopping and chatting in the park. I never stop and chat in the park. I'm always either just running in the park or just passing through, but I never stop and chat in the Mm -hmm. park. It really makes you think you should stop and smell the roses. And he was at the bottom of the park waiting for his Nike runners to come through. And he... um, I, a friend had asked me something about what this Jamaican guy had said to me, and I repeated it. And Jonathan looked over and he said, you talk to your mother with a mouth like that? Because, I mean, it was not nice what I had said. But I was just relaying the story it was of the what was said to me. Jonathan? Right. And I said, did you, and I was had spoken in Patois, and I said, did you understand what I said? And he said, Yes, and I'm ashamed for you. And I said, but I didn't say that. That's what the guy said to me. And then he said, do you, uh, he said, you know, we're on the same track team. And I thought, I've never seen you before. Who are you? And he said, you know, I run with Central Park Track Club. And I said, okay. And then, you know, then we left and my friend Julie said, that guy was trying to talk to you for so long. And I said, really? I just had no clue. And eventually, and he said, And Jonathan says about that whole situation, he said, I was trying to make it very obvious that I was trying to talk to you, but I just, I had no clue. And then he eventually emailed me, and we emailed back and forth for a long time before even connecting, and um, it was pretty funny. But that wasn't our first interaction. The first time we had, and I found this out a couple months into our dating, when Jonathan said to me, did you run the Brooklyn Half Marathon in whatever year that was? And I said no and he said there was this woman who I ran next to who um, looked like you and I thought I'm forever hearing how everybody looks like me and he and I said no I didn't run it and he said and she she was running with this guy and she told a joke and I said what joke 
I mean, it wasn't me, but like, what joke? He says, what do the fish say when he swam into the wall? Damn. And I thought, that's the dumbest joke I've ever heard. And, and then it just occurs to me that a friend of mine had run the half that year, and I paced him. And sure enough, I did run the half. And Jonathan was running next to me, and he thought, oh, you know, when she said, my kids told me this joke, he said, oh, you know, she's married with kids, and, you know, she's with this guy, uh-huh, whatever. Uh-huh. Oh, I Didn't, see. But we were running next to each other um, for a while. Interesting. Uh, so you were pacing someone yeah, you weren't officially in. Right. So How crazy is that? But he remembered this, like... Two years later, and I said, did you stalk me? And he said, I would have, but, I, you know, your, your name didn't come up. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I cannot, and he, his mind is, is like a steel trap. I just, he just remembers everything. You don't want to get into an argument with, uh, no, no, with Coach no. Kane. <laughs> Coach you better be sure you get your facts very, very straight. Oh, he's good with that stuff. Yes, yes. I, <laughs> uh, you know, at some point, uh, I was part of the Nike Run Club, and at some point, words came out like Sin Kane or something like that. <laughs> So everybody was talking about this, but I, but I actually, the first time I actually met you was last year at the Jack Rabbit. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the New York Running Show. Yes. And yes. you were so, such a warm person. I oh, said, Oh, thank oh, you. No wonder Jonathan fell for this, <laughs> this was, smart yeah. and fast. Well, he made you fast. That's what I was like. He made me fast, and I, I feel really lucky. He is so supportive of me. And even now when I think, you know, Simon, our son, is nine and a half months old, and I have been racing this whole season, and this racing could not be possible without Jonathan. He makes my training a priority. I mean, the first, the number one priority is Simon. Simon's a priority, and then Jonathan allows everything else to happen. Like, I mean, I do a lot of my biking on the Computrainer where Simon's in his playpen, we're talking, and Jonathan's making sure that if he needs more attention, he's there. And um, It's very interesting. Yeah. Every marriage is different, and, and, yeah. and Jonathan sort of invented his own playbook. Yeah. He's, but yeah. he's probably, you know, thought about it very carefully, how to be a great dad, a he, great husband. He is. I could not be luckier. Well, I'm so happy for you both. Thank you. We're almost out of time, Nicole, but I wanted to discuss a little bit well, you know, before we go into uh-huh. that, the, the Jamaicans, you're from Jamaica, uh-huh. did fabulously well in, uh, in the Olympics. Uh-huh. This is their 50th uh, anniversary uh-huh. in Jamaica of, of their independence. Uh-huh. So are, are you going to go back to Jamaica and celebrate? Or? Yeah, you know what? My mom is always asking. She's like, when are you bringing Simon home? When are you bringing Simon home? So um, I will probably go down by the end of the year or so. And, you know, I in the a few years ago, I got my U.S. citizenship, finally. And even though the passport says U.S., when it's Olympic time, I cheer Jamaica. Well, I cheer Jamaica. Well, yeah. you know, what's their secret doing so fabulously <laughs> well, both the men and the women? You know what? I think here in the U.S., track is an afterthought. And in Jamaica, um, track is a big deal. And we celebrate our runners. We really do. And I think you could have somebody um, like a... Tyson Gay or somebody, you know, walk down the street and people would sense that he's a runner. I mean, I was in the airport the other day and Abdi was walking through and most people had no idea. And, you know, these are big athletes. Right, and, right. you know, Meb could walk down the street and a lot of people wouldn't even know him. That's There's right. no way our Jamaican runners could walk down the street without people celebrating them. So the celebrities in Jamaica. Oh, without a doubt. I mean... You have in Halfway Tree in the town center a big screen during um, the Olympics, and people just come out with their pot covers and are, you know, banging on them, and just it makes our country feel really proud. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. So, what are your future challenges in terms of uh, athletically? Um, well, I have sprint nationals coming up this weekend, and then I'm going to the world championships for duathlon in France in September. In France? In France. In Nancy, France. When is that? September 22nd, I think. Of next year? Of this year. This year. This year. Oh, my goodness. And that will end my racing season for this and, year. And Jonathan and Simon going with you for those? No. You know what? We thought long and hard about it, and I think... Simon has been such a trooper in traveling to the races, and it's hard on him. And we thought about taking him to France and how that would really disrupt his schedule. And um, 
We're a little nervous about having them, Jonathan and Simon, be here without me for, for six days. And um, I think it'll just be easier in a weird way on everybody if they stay here yeah, and I go. Yeah, six days. It will feel like six ah, weeks. Yes, I think so. <laughs> Good luck. And I'm glad you were able to make uh, caught you. you in time in between uh, <laughs> yeah. triathlons. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, in. what a pleasure it has been, Will. Thank you Wish so you much. you and Jonathan and Simon all the happiness in the world. Oh, thank you. We already feel so happy and lucky. Excellent. Thank you.